Hello students and welcome to our second uh, subunit in History and Approaches, Unit 1A. Um, this is uh, Unit 1A.2. We are going to be discussing scientific development and the different perspectives of psychology. After learning about the historical contributions of philosophy to the development of psychology in Unit 1.1, uh, we will further explore the development into the modern era and examine the beginnings of the science that we now know today as psychology. All right, we will be placing a lot of emphasis um, on all underlines and boldface words as well as all the people and their contributions to, uh, to psychology. So make sure you pay uh, close attention to those uh, people and concepts throughout this video. As we will learn in this unit, not all psychologists look at psychology the same way. Some believe that you are who you are purely because of your genetics. Again, from last unit, this is the nature argument. However, some also believe that experience plays a much bigger factor. And again, this is the nurture argument of how, what contributes most to our personality and our behavior. Psychology is a broad field that aims to answer questions from many different perspectives. We are going to look at a few of the schools and approaches to psychology in this unit. By the late 1800s, psychology was beginning to emerge as a separate scientific discipline. It was beginning to break away from the fields of biology and philosophy um, as its own field of scientific inquiry. Charles Darwin's groundbreaking theory of natural selection first opened the door to the contemporary scientific investigation into human mental, uh, mental processes of multiple species. Natural selection, Darwin found, is the gradual process by which biological traits become either more or less common in a population as a function of the effect of inherited traits on the differential reproductive successes of organisms interacting with the environment. We'll talk about more in class. While Darwin did not focus on humans, instead focusing on birds and other species, other scientists would come along to begin uh, would come along later to begin the scientific study of the human brain and how it is developed and how it functions. This initially led to two separate schools in the genesis of psychology, structuralism and functionalism. Structuralism, as we can see here, or the school of structuralism, um, aims, its, its primary focus is on the structure of the mind and how it identifies the basic elements of consciousness. All right. Structuralism was largely developed and uh, supported by Wilhelm Wundt, um, who's very significant to psychology as he is credited uh, with being the founder of scientific psychology when he opened um, the first laboratory for the scientific study of psychology in Leipzig, Germany in 1879. <clears throat> His student, Edward B. Titchener, is actually given a lot of credit for bringing uh, structuralism to the United States and then further expanding on structuralism um, more so than Wundt uh, did in Germany. Well, what, what is structuralism? Again, let's, let's read the definition. The school of structuralism aims to f uh, it focuses on the structure of the mind and identifies the basic elements of consciousness. Well, how do we, how do we study the structure of the mind before, before MRIs, before um, X-rays, and, and, and all those new uh, innovative technologies? How do we study that? How do we study the basic elements of consciousness um, that is the emphasis of structuralism. Well, Wundt and Titchener used the uh, technique of introspection. Introspection is the process of looking inward to identify how one feels, thinks, or acts. So, for example, if I, if I had uh, two students in the class um, volunteer to be subjects in a, a brief little experiment of mine, and in that experiment I drop a ball, and then I have each student record how long they think the ball took to hit the ground. Well, that would be introspection. They're thinking about how they're reacting to the stimuli, the ball dropping, and then the data from that, from that experiment would then give me, the researcher, some insight into how they organize information um, and how their consciousness is structured in the mind. Um, and that's structuralism, uh, the school of structuralism, basically, essentially. Uh, we'll talk about it more in class tomorrow. Now, Conversely, there is the opposing school of functionalism. This school was started by an American named William James, pictured here, who believed that Wundt and Titchener were asking the wrong questions concerning the understanding of the human mind. William James focused not so much on the structure of the mind 
and conscious and, and our conscious thinking, but more on the function of the mind. Functionalism focuses on how we adapt to our environment. In other words, how does our brain function in a given environment? How does our environment affect our mental processes and our behavior? While structuralism would go on to influence development of gestalt psychology, functionalism would be the basis for most of psychological research. William James made another significant contribution to the field of psychology as well. He, uh, it took him a decade to finish it, but when he did, it would be known as the most complete and reliable academic authority in the field of psychology. This book is titled The Principles of Psychology, and it is the basis uh, for intro to psychology courses uh, around the world today. In fact, our own textbook is modeled after this book, uh, which was written in the late 1800s. While structuralism and functionalism were two of the first schools of thought in psychology, as we said on the previous slide, uh, structuralism gave way to gestalt psychology. Um, after a time, structuralism and functionalism kind of uh, began to uh, diminish and prestige, and gestalt psychology, as well as other perspectives and schools of psychology, uh, began to take over, and that's what we'll begin to explore throughout the year. But to begin, gestalt psychology uh, was founded by Max Wertheimer, all right? and one important phrase to know, to, uh, to memorize, especially for the AP exam, is that gestalt psychology emphasizes that the whole is more than the sum of its parts. Okay, for example, a beautiful painting. All right, beautiful painting is more than just an image. All right, there are angles, there are colors, there's textures to the painting. There are just, there's a lot more going on in the painting than what you're actually seeing. Okay? So that is gestalt psychology, and we're going to emphasize that more in a later unit, Sensations and Perceptions. Again, this is just a general introduction. All right, so you are definitely going to need to memorize this chart. Um, it is on page 11 in your textbook. Uh, for the next section in this subunit, we are going to start going over the approaches, the eight approaches to psychology. As you see on this chart, there are seven approaches. Um, so we are going to be going uh, over a few more than, than are in your textbook. Okay? So you might want to pause this or turn to page 11 in your textbook and go ahead and start memorizing this chart because this is very important information um, that we're going to be revisiting throughout the year. The first approach to studying psychology that we'll discuss today is the behavioral approach. This approach focuses on measuring and recording observable behavior, typically behavior resulting from learning. So like if you touch the hot stove, it's going to burn your hand. You're probably less likely to touch the hot stove, all right? So you've learned something which has altered or changed your future behavior. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, we're going to cover, we're going to go more into behavior and learning in unit eight. Uh, but some names to familiarize yourself with is Ivan Pavlov, who is famous for his work on classical conditioning uh, with the use of dogs, as well as um, John B. Watson, who worked with Baby Albert, as well as uh, B.F. Skinner, who's working with, who worked with uh, operant conditioning with his, um, it says rats here, but he actually worked with pigeons, um, with rewards and punishments. And we'll talk about this more in detail, and actually have an activity with this in class. All, right. All these men believed that psychology should be the science of behavior. Of course, when behaviorism was developed, we didn't have, again, MRIs, EEG machines to actually look into the um, live functioning of the brain. So they thought that the only real way to study human understanding and human learning, uh, human, human mental processes, is by observing their behavior, which reflects what they know and what they've learned. <clears throat> 